<laughs> How's it going? Ooh. Uh, so yeah, welcome. I'm Stevie Henriette of Art of the Zodiac, and this is Spencer Michaud of, of Spencer Michaud Astrology. And uh, we're talking fixed stars today. Um, I should say that, I mean, my preface is that this is based on a presentation you did on fixed stars, which I watched, and this is sort of a follow-up for um, clarification. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. I, I did a, a talk for uh, Astrology Victoria, which is a group out in um, Victoria, British Columbia, and uh, have some friends in there that uh, were in class with us with a Chutababa's Nightlight Astrology group there. And um, they asked me to do a, a webinar, and I'd been doing some fixed star work, so I thought that would be something that would be interesting to uh, explore. Um, I'm still, I would still consider myself somewhat of a newbie to, to fixed stars. So I like, I, 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 uh, enjoy studying them. Um, but it's a, st a topic that you can study for a lifetime. And literally there have been authors of these books that I have mm -hmm. that have, you know, dedicated their entire life to figuring out what this is all about, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, let's step back a set. Like, what is this all about? You know, someone, we were having a chat earlier this, this morning and someone was like, how many fixed stars are there? Which was like a loaded question. <laughs> There's thousands of them, <laughs> billions. There's billions of them. Uh, yeah. It's, um, yeah. So there's as many fixed stars as there are stars in the sky, yeah. uh, which is, you know, endless. But I think that a, a better answer to that question as far as we, we are concerned is, which ones are important for ast astrology and finding meaning and which ones have people ascribed meaning to over the course of history and over the course of, um, you know, different cultural mythologies and things of that nature. And I think that there are, you know, different answers for that. There are some people that, you know, only use these like kind of like 48 fixed stars uh, some people really concentrate on 15 Bohemian fixed stars, which were uh, associated with astrological magic. Um, you know, there's ones that are really close to the ecliptic or the path of the sun, and there's ones that are, you know, way up in the in the uh, off the ecliptic near the celestial poles. Like if we were looking out at the horizon, we might be able to see stars that were behind us. So that's something like. Uh, that astrologers have tried to determine the strength and power of a star based on where it was in relationship to the, the planetary ecliptic or the solar ecliptic there. Um, but yeah, it's you, you, we have a number of constellations that are going to give meaning to these stars. Mm -hmm. And um, there are as many uh, stories as there are cultures for each one of those constellations, which that's that complicates it, right? Yeah, because I, one of the things that I think to, to to point out at the very beginning of this is that, you know, one of the things that I found really fascinating about fixed stars is that uh, there seems to be some unification of meaning, sort of like Carl Jung's collective unconscious, right, where we're saying like, well, how did these cultures that never had any communication with one another have similar mythological stories or cultural stories. And, um, you know, after I read this book, Hamlet's Mill, that one of their big arguments is that we share these cultural, you know, themes and archetypal themes because we're all staring at the same sky. You know, we're all trying to make meaning out of this, the movement of the heavens. And that to me was a really kind of a nice aha moment. And, um, you know, it was really kind of helping me to to understand what this is all about. So, so just to like to back it up for people who are like maybe new to astrology and have like no idea what we're talking about. Essentially, when we say fixed stars, we are talking about the stars in the sky, and clearly some of them have more meaning to us based on maybe their placements in constellations, how close they are to us. Right. Um, and when we can talk about, so constellations are one way, it seems a big point for you of starting to have these, or maybe that is the biggest way of talking about fixed stars, how they fit into these different stories, which then, you know, these stories change throughout cultures, who's looking at the sky and there is overlap with these things. Totally. Um, 
for you, like if we're going to talk about fixed stars, and again, I know people you work with different ones, maybe we could start with which ones do you work with mostly? Um, or, or they're most special to you and maybe what's a good starting off point to have this conversation? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I would say that I have been over the last year and a half or so, I've been going through Bernadette Brady's fixed star books, who is, uh, you know, a pioneer of bringing fixed stars back into the astrological uh, awareness, I think, after they had kind of laid dormant for a period of time and lost some of their importance as far as astrologers were concerned and, and their use within our practices. Mm -hmm. So I got her book, um, Brady's Book of Fixed Stars, and the one that connects the planets with it as well. And she has about 64 or so fixed stars in there that are fairly bright magnitude stars. Um, and I've been kind of following along with her book over the course of the year and a half and seeing when certain planets would make conjunctions with them. Now, I know that this is interesting, though, because I would say that I'm using the fixed stars that she deems important, but I'm not necessarily using her calculation method. So, so I'm kind of, a, yeah. I'm a little bit of a heretic when it comes to that and like trying to blend these things together. Um, but I think that, you know, another thing that got me interested in the fixed stars was Austin Kopic's book, 36 Faces, right? So one of the th projects I have been working on a lot is, is trying to understand the decans or the 10 degree sections of the Zodiac. Yeah. And um, what I'm finding is that a lot of the decanic meanings are coming from which fixed stars are rising over the Eastern horizon with this area of the Zodiac, right? So what I've been doing is I've been kind of looking in these 10 degree sections to see what fixed stars are in this decan what tarot card is association, associated with the Deccan, and how can I kind of integrate all of those meanings together to figure out what the, what the essence or the essential nature of that Deccanic placement is all about, you know? And that's, that's been giving me some really interesting insights. Like, for, for example, recently we just went through uh, Pisces 2, okay? We're, we're in the very tail end of Pisces 3, 20 to 30 degrees of Pisces. But in Pisces 2, between 10 and 20 degrees of Pisces, there's a fixed star called Achernar. And that one is associated with uh, the river, the Eridanus in the sky. So there's this big long river that go that a constellation that looks like a river in the yeah. sky. And at the very end of it is a fixed star called Achernar. Mm -hmm. And that's at 15 degrees Pisces by projected ecliptical degree, and we'll get into that. But um, but the interesting thing about that is that it's associated with a myth of a, uh, a Greek myth of Phaethon, right? Phaethon was the son of Apollo who tried to drive his father's chariot across the sky and crashed it, you know, like, like he, act he actually got uh, struck down by Zeus because Zeus was like, oh, hell no, I'm not going to let this little punk, you know, <laughs> screw, screw every, screw up my beautiful creation. Right. <laughs> and, and he, and he just was, it was, and it's a story though, of like, um, trying to do too much, like, like having a little bit overconfidence and maybe hubris and, uh, trying, you know, what you could learn from that is maybe we may feel driven to ascend to the heights of our dreams but we may not be completely ready yet and that could lead to a downfall because phaethon fell from the sky and drowned in the uridanus in the river and um i just thought that that was really that that story has been coming and and popping out to me a lot lately i actually what i one of the things that i do to kind of understand these symbolic languages better is i, I journal and I, I write down a lot of my dreams. I write down a lot of what's going on in the sky. And as I was going back in my journal throughout February, I had a dream that was very, very similar to the Phaethon story yeah. that, that happened right before the sun was going to, to make contact with that fixed star. Before I'd even started the research for it, like that story, I had a dream about it where I was basically trying to buy 
uh, a used car that was yellow that used to belong to my dad. <laughs> like this is literally a dream that I wrote down. I'm trying to buy a used car and it, it, it used to belong to my dad, but it was like, you know, it had, it had 25,000 miles on it and like something like that. And there was some problem with it and I couldn't drive it. And like, and it, it, and there even was something about, and then I was in a lake. I was like, I was like, and wondering, is this car a boat? You know, and I was like, holy shit, this is incredible that yeah. that that story came to me basically in a dream for that, the story of that fixed star. I mean, it was, it was amazing the correlations between that myth and, and my dream. Right. You know that, I mean, that sort of touches on a whole like other topic about your astrology practice. I know one of my teachers, Adam Summer, Oh, you know, he frequently says that at this point in his career, he doesn't even read that many books anymore. He like listens to planets to speak to him in his dreams. But it feels like you're so in tune with the fixed stars that you're starting to like, you know, divine the dream. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's not just like you're dreaming about them. It's like there feels like there is a a connection and they're like speaking to you. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yes, I, I agree with that statement um, wholeheartedly because I think that in ancient times, I think that they would, you know, people would literally go to um, the Orphic, the Delphic Oracle and go there to receive some kind of oracular message. Yeah. And a lot of the process that you'd go through, I read this book on this recently, it's called Listening to the Oracle, and they, they described what, it, what, what someone who would go to the Oracle might experience. And they went through like, you know, a daily kind of, you know, a life, a day in the life of a, of a visitor to the Delphic Oracle. And basically they would put you through these kind of ritual cleansings yeah. and then they would like, you know, almost bury you under the ground or in this pool or something like that so that you could receive a dream. And it, the dream would be one of the things that would be speaking to you. Right. Uh, and this may be a process that the, the Oracle herself went through as well. So I think that dreams have been something that have spoken to people as far as oracular messages for, for as, me, as long as we've been human beings, right? So I think that it, it makes, a lot of, makes a lot of sense. Our teacher had an interesting dream that he posted about. I don't know if you saw this. No, today. no. What was it? He, he was, uh, so yeah, he, had, he posted that he had a dream about um, singing meatloafs. I would do anything for love and like he was meatloaf and he was singing to the woman in the video in the 90s and uh and it was really speaking to his his devotional practices actually i think there was a lot of really uh really nice symbolism as far as his commitment to his devotional practices it just it was sort of amusing because that video is is pretty funny and and you know where we are you know, we were teenagers in the '90s. Sorry, if I'm giving away too much, but th that one, that that video was always a really like strange anomaly for the for the late '90s. You know, um, and we should say for those who don't know, we are talking about a Chuta Baba. Yeah. Um, at least for, I, I know I'm confident that I'm pronouncing a Chuta right, but is it mm -hmm. Babadas? I always forget the last. Yeah, a Chuta Babadas. Chuta ba Babadas. So that's your public he's this public dream of his so people want to you know follow right. that's who we're, we're referring to wasn't there like a beauty and the beast themed that music video or something as i recall i know we're getting yes. technical, but i totally. was listening to bring it back I, like i listened to the call map and i listened to stories as i fall asleep at night and i was listening to this rendition of um eros and psyche and i realized it is so similar to the beauty and the beast story oh yeah like this like invisible house where like these like servants come out anyway so yeah Bring i mean those, those themes are repeatable right those uh -huh. themes keep coming back and back around yeah. and i think that that's actually one of the main ways that we can excuse me understand the fixed stars is they are kind of the i would say some of the the generators of some of those archetypal thematic stories now we can get into arguments as whether whether they are causing them or whether they are symbolic of some kind of archetypal theme that we're exploring, but I think that the, the a lot of the stories that we see connected with the fixed star constellations, they come up over and over and over again in popular culture, um, in our in our movies and our stories. I mean, I think there's like things like 
you know, like the superhero movies of modern times, yeah. we can connect those as some as modern mythology, you know, and, and a lot of the themes that we see through different superhero type things, probably we can, if we looked hard enough, we could connect to some of the fixed star themes. I mean, definitely we have like, you know, people like Superman who, who would probably, you know, do some of the Hercules mythology, right? And, yeah. and things of that nature, other superheroes fall, fall into line with that as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible how the, the divine or the spirit wants to speak to us and give us messages. I think that's the, that's the biggest shift in my studies that I've had since I started studying traditional astrology is I've kind of gone come full circle. Like I started off thinking a little bit more about, you know, from a little bit what I would consider a new age perspective where we're, you know, you think about creating your own reality or co-creating with the divine. Then you study traditional astrology for a little bit and you're like, oh man, a lot of this might be more faded than I imagined. And then you come back around and say, okay, well, I've got some agency within this. And I, yes, there may be some events in our life that were, are faded, but we, we are able to kind of make some adjustments based on our foreknowledge and our pro noia and things of that nature. But the fixed stars definitely were associated more with, I think, fate and with more of the unalterable things that we may experience, whereas the planets are a little bit more about negotiation, I think. So I think this is a good jumping in point because this is a great video, I think, for people who've seen your full lecture on the fixed stars. And this is a nice, like, sort of deeper dive, perhaps, um, keeping that in mind. Um, you know, as an astrologer, let's jump right in. How do you use to work with fixed stars without sort of overcomplicating a chart? Yeah, I use them with projected ecliptical degree. So there's two different ways to think about how we can find our fixed stars in a chart. And projected ecliptical degree was a, a way that Ptolemy kind of squashed all the stars onto the ecliptic. Like, and I can show you what he's doing if you want, if you'd like to see the screen. Yeah, sure. So I'll share my screen and we'll kind of take a look at this together. All right, can you see that? Yeah, let me make it bigger. Okay, perfect. All right, so, so what we're looking at here is the, the sky as we are speaking for the most part here. And this green line here is the ecliptic. That's the path of the sun uh, over the course of both a day and it also measures out the, the year. We've got these two different motions that are happening. One of them is called primary motion, which is the movement of the sun as it rises in clockwise motion over the course of a day. So you see, like I was starting off at the early hours and the sun is rising, mm -hmm. it's ascending to the height and then it's setting again. Okay, yeah. so that's primary motion. That's actually the motion of the of the fixed stars because okay. the, the stars are moving uh, relative to each other. Now, here is something that is uh, we think about with the planets, which is secondary motion. If I moved the chart forward by days, yep. we would see that all of the planets on the ecliptic, okay, here's like, for example, here's Venus, right? Let's, let's highlight Venus. They are going to be moving along the path of the sun for the most part they stay within you know a certain amount of degrees and this this little fast thing here it's mercury okay yeah. you can see it shoot right by right <laughs> and that's the secondary motion where the planets are moving against the grain they're moving counterclockwise over the over many uh days and that's why they called these wandering stars because they change their position in relationship to the constellations and these fixed patterns against the the background of the sky right yeah. does that make sense mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. so so this is uh i think the the planets have a little bit more it's almost like the planets are a little bit more flexible right because they are moving in this different direction as far as like form is concerned the yeah. secondary motion was thought to be for, like related to the moon and the generation and decay of material form and this motion of the sun was said to be closer to the divine because it was a little bit more predictable. 
and it didn't really uh, it didn't change as much. It was it was a more predictable type of experience. And when we're when I'm using fixed stars, what mm -hmm. what I do, like Ptolemy did, and is I will take a projected ecliptical degree. So for example, let's go back to today. All right. So today is the 19th. Yes. <laughs> we are looking at right here. Here's Mars, right? Okay. Okay. See Mars? Mm -hmm. So Mars is very close to the ecliptic because it's a planet. And what, what I'm going to do is instead of, uh, I'm going to take Mars and I'm going to project that degree. Right now, Mars is at about nine or 10 degrees of Gemini. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to project it out from the ecliptic and I'm going to see if there are any important stars that it hits or that it's in alignment with. And in, in this case, we have a really uh, prominent fixed star called Aldebaran that Mars is in, a, in alignment with. Now we can do this with like any of these planets like Venus, here's Venus, and we can project all the way up to the celestial pole as well. So like Venus is pretty close uh, it just passed over a fixed star um, in Pegasus called Markab. So you see how that one's a little bit further away off the ecliptic? Yeah. So I have a question. This is where sure. it gets a little confused. So maybe I'm looking, because I'm used to using like an astro like looking at just like the astrology chart of the day. Maybe I'm not right. looking at that. And I know that Mars is at nine degrees Gemini. Mm -hmm. Do I look like, are there a list of where like fixed stars live? Do I go, ooh, what lives at like 10 degrees Gemini? Is that totally. like... That's yeah. what I think that's the part I get hung up on because I'm like, ah, I have to stare in my little brain. <laughs> right. Brain yes. Yes. And let me let me show you. I'm gonna stop my share okay. of this for a second and we'll share something else here. So okay. I will show you. Uh, here's a program that I have called Astro Gold. Okay. So here is the the day, okay. and here's our current time. So in Astro Gold, I can go and I can do this thing called sheets. Are you able to see that? Uh, I can't see your sheets, but I know what a sheet. Okay. I know what a sheet is. Okay, so there is. Um, maybe I'll be able to do something different here. I'll share the sheets part of it. Okay. There's the sheets. Okay, so there's the uh, the listing of the different stars and the conjunctions and oppositions by projected ecliptical degree. Now the, okay. here here we have a listing of all the different you know, kind of lists that you could use. So here's like all the named stars, 507 named stars. There's actually probably even more than that, but um, we've got uh, the brightest magnitude stars, okay. which, which there are 48 of. These are the ones that I think were listed in Ptolemy's uh, Amalgust, which was one of his, um, you know, kind of cataloging of fixed stars. Is very ancient. Th these may also have been the ones that were listed in Anonymous's 379, which is an ancient text that talks about fixed stars. By the so, way, do you, is, I, sorry, I have go to ahead. Go there because I love the name. It mm -hmm. sounds so futuristic, and every time I hear it, I'm like, that sounds so cool. Anonymous 379. <laughs> right? It sounds like someone who like invented some sort of like crypto, like. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 pretty cool, and there, that's where a lot of our significations come from too. With these fixed stars, is both Ptolemy and that fragmentary, that kind of like small text that that we see with with anonymous. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm looking at here is Venus. Or I'm sorry, Mercury conjoining Deneb. Okay, this is like uh, Deneb uh, LDJ which is a fixed star in the constellation Cygnus, the swan. Okay. Um, so that one's sort of about a po having a poetic nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we, if we broke down the symbolism associated with swans, we could s sort of understand some of the symbolism with that fixed star. Um, you know, how swans can go through transformations from the ugly duckling to the beautiful white bird. Swans are also really territorial, uh, I'm finding. Um, in my research on swans. And uh, so there may be like with Mercury here, we may be experiencing something where we have to be careful not to get a little bit territorial with our knowledge and our communication and something like that. Um, you can also see in this chart, Aldebaran is conjoining Mars right now. And um, 
Yeah, so so that's one way you can see as far as a list. Here are the Bohemian stars, the 15 ones I was talking about that they use in astrological magic. And sometimes I'll switch back and forth between you know these different lists if I'm working with a client mm -hmm. to kind of see what the conjunctions are like in their their charts. Now, th that being said, um, we have. Sorry, can you still see me now? I can still see sorry. you. Okay. That being said. There is another way of working with the fixed stars that is called parans, right? Paranotella. Paranotella. I don't know. There's, it's a really long like Greek word that I always mess up. But the shorthand for it is parans, okay? Yeah. And this is something that Bernadette Brady really talks about a lot in her books. Um, it is her way of describing it takes time to understand is what I will say. Yeah. Uh, she's very technical about um, her descriptions, and it it is going to, I think, take me more time studying her method to be able to unravel it completely. But my understanding of it, my basic gist of it is this. Parans basically means is that when one star is at an angle in the chart, like the ascendant, the midheaven, the descendant, or the, the IC, and another star is at another angle, they are in a relationship with one another, okay? okay. So here's, if I shared my, my chart again. Sorry, I'm, I'm going back and forth between different charts here. Oh, no, no, but, it's fine. So you can see my chart? Let me get a big one, yeah. So if I had, if I had a, a star, for example, rising over the horizon okay. at 11 degrees of Leo, and then some other star was conjoined the midheaven uh, at 29 Aries or something, they would have a Paran relationship. Now, it gets sticky, though. This is where it gets sticky, because if that was actually how it worked, it would be very easy to do it. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know. But the, 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 really, the sticky part about it is that what Bernadette Brady is doing in her Paran method is expanding the sky out from that squashing of all all of the stars onto the ecliptic and mm -hmm. looking at the sky from a 360 degree spherical type of experience and what that does though the, the issue that i have it's not an issue that i have with it it's not it doesn't make it wrong it's just the issue i have with using it without a specific type of software and for the work that i do is that the the planet uh, or the sorry, the fixed star changes its relationship to the ecliptic based on your location. Okay, so it's look per, per, perans is location specific, um, and it it makes it difficult to uh, figure out where the star is exactly, and unless you have her software which is called starlight or her book with these really complicated tables that are oh my goodness it's, it's very so difficult <laughs> yeah it's very difficult to like figure it out with her tables not to say that it's impossible like i think that if i spend enough time with it i could probably like you know have a, a pretty good understanding of it as far as how to use that um i just have not had enough time with her method yet to feel confident in using her method but I do know that there's some astrologers out there that are, are very skilled at using her method. There's a few on Twitter that are doing really great work with this method. Um, and they've talked a lot about fixed stars and do use that method in their readings. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that one method is, is wrong or one method is right. I'm sure that there will be some people out there that are very um, attached to their method. But... Um, for me, what I look at is what degree is the fixed star at by projected ecliptical degree? And is there a planet touching it, you know, within the chart? And one thing that I think a compromise that I've made with like Bernadette Brady's method and the projected ecliptical degree method is there is some literature in some of these ancient source texts that talks about using ecliptical stars in the conjunction method and using the, the stars that are further off the ecliptic using this Paran method, right? Mm -hmm. 
And that makes some sense to me because if they're if they're on the ecliptic, they're going to be very close to the planet visibly as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like Aldebaran, for example, is very close to the ecliptic. So I, I feel confident in yeah. saying that the moon and Mars are conjoining Aldebaran today and tomorrow. And oh, the oh, right. Sorry. So let's back this up for a moment um, yeah. so we can start to go because I really want to get into like how you work with these yeah. um, because, you know, you're a great astrologer and I trust you <laughs> I just sure. to kind of get the more meaning. So maybe we could pause there for a moment. Yeah. So today we have Aldebaran conjunct the moon and Mars or conjunct Mars, right? right? right okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moon and Mars at this moment, moon, moon's going to move quickly. Yeah. What I'll... Go ahead. <laughs> Right. What does that mean, right? Like, so how would you, like, what's one interpretation of that? When you read that, like, what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so Aldebaran said about nine or 10 degrees Gemini. Okay. Um, and, you know, the, there was planetary natures that were assigned to each fixed star okay. by Ptolemy. And, you know, sometimes we can glean some meaning by looking at the star and understanding kind of its essence. And Aldebaran was of the nature of Mars, um, and some authors say of Mars and Jupiter. Okay. So that's one way we can start to see what this star might be all about. It's kind of has a martial, maybe more aggressive type of uh, energy to it. It is red. I mean, it's it's literally the eye of the bull. Let's let's look at our, our sky for a minute here. Yeah because I think that it's cool just to see it. So here we have Aldebaran right here. Okay. okay. And I can kind of zoom in. It's, it's the eye of the bull, right? It's like the, uh, it's a very red star, so we can get significations from its color. Um, it was associated with the royal fixed stars of Persia so this is one good entry point into fixed stars is studying the four royal fixed stars, Aldebaran, Fomaho, uh, Regulus, and Antares. And they were the markers of the, um, the equinoxes and the solstices in ancient times. Okay, So Aldebaran marked out the, the spring equinox because of a concept called precession, yeah. uh, you know, this, the fixed star positions do change over time. They change roughly one degree of ecliptical longitude every uh, 72 years. So back in you know 3,000 years ago, uh, Aldebaran was the star that would rise at this point, this equinox point. So mm -hmm. you can see here, this is the celestial equator, this red line. Yeah. It's projected out onto the sky. And when it crosses the ecliptic, like it's going to tomorrow, yeah. um, that's when we have our equinox, equal day and equal night. Yeah. Now, back in 3,000 years ago, check this out. This is We can actually do this here. This is sweet. This is I love cool this program. Program. Yeah. program. So now we're looking, if I go back in time to the uh, spring equinox, mm -hmm. there it is. So April 14th was the spring equinox back wow. in ancient times. And you can see that Aldebaran is rising with that star. So if I look, go and I go to the time when it's going to be rising over the horizon, there's Aldebaran appearing with the sun. See that? Yeah. There it is. Okay. And so, so they thought of the stars that were rising with the sun at, at important times across the year as sort of like a guardian spirit or a deity to be worshiped. And, um, you know, Aldebaran, you know, bestowed great honor, power, great material power. Um, but Bernadette Brady talks about certain nemeses that were associated with each of these four royal fixed stars. And with Aldebaran, there is an association with the Mithras myth. And I actually wanted to read this to you because I think this will give us, this is from her book, uh, Brady's book of fixed stars. I just want to read an excerpt on Aldebaran. Okay, so this is on page 233, Aldebaran the Concept. It says, Aldebaran is one of the great stars in the sky, one of the royal stars of Persia, the watcher in the east, the great cornerstone marking the spring equinox. In this capacity, Aldebaran was the god Mithras, or Ahura Mazda, 
the slayer of the cosmic bull. Mithras was a great military god who gave victories to his followers, but only if they followed the strictest procedure in his worship. This procedure also reflected is also reflected in the writings and worship of the god prophet Zarathustra of Persian, of Persian origin, who said to have learned wisdom from Ohura Mazda. His name means star worshiper, and his teachings were meant to restore the belief in the sanctity of the material world, and ultimately, it is said, to restore the earth to its original state of perfection. Whether Aldebaran is connected to Mithras or, or Zarathustra, or possibly even both, we are able to derive a, a more three-dimensional meaning for Aldebaran from these ancient beliefs and customs, which emphasize success linked to the integrity of mortal, morals and objectives. Mithras was the warrior king who also bore the title Lord of Contracts. He considered all exchanges as sacred and therefore oversaw the business of his followers, insisting on their honesty and purity, failing which the follower would be condemned to an ordeal of fire. Okay, <laughs> so, right? So, Brady's basically like, okay, because of the associations with the cosmic bull and mm -hmm. the story of Mithras and Ahura Mazda and his demand for integrity that, you know, connections with this fixed star speak to, you know, us as human beings when we have connections with this fixed star, having to, you know, have honesty and moral integrity at all costs, lest we experience, you know, a trial by fire. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's layered like this, like these, these fixed stars have layers and layers and layers of meaning that change with different cultural understandings as well. Like I don't have the dexterity yet to be able to pull up five different cultural myths of, of Aldebaran yet, yeah. but I'm working on it. <laughs> like, right. But I think that, uh, these fixed stars in particular, Aldebaran, Fomahal, Regulus, and Antares, always have some kind of, um, you know, thing that you need to overcome before they will grant you the great power. Like Regulus, it's like pride or pursuing power or authority at all costs, right? Regulus, will you, um, to back up, um, yeah. so Regulus and Leo, will you remind me of the degrees of the four of the royal stars? Yeah, so... Uh, Aldebaran is at about 10 degrees Gemini now. It yeah. used to be in Taurus, but it is processed into Gemini. Okay. Yeah. Um, Regulus has been at 29 degrees of Leo for a very long time, but has just recently moved to about zero degrees of Virgo. Nice. So that is an important shift too when these royal fixed stars change signs. Mm -hmm. And one thing you could think about with that is maybe – the type of authority that we respect now with Regulus, the heart of the lion. Okay, we can see that. Uh, where is it? I have to go a little bit forward to be able to show you Regulus here. Um, there's Regulus. Oops. Regulus is right there. Okay. The heart, the heart of the lion. Okay. Yeah. The consolidation of leonine essence. And what Regulus could speak to potentially by moving into Virgo is that we exalt skillfulness now humility mm -hmm. right um maybe there isn't just this consolidated kingly authority of one special person maybe it's more about your skill set you know your mercurial skill set your ability to bring things into manifestation and, and to communicate and to figure out what stays and what goes and that's another interesting way of exploring um what these fixed stars could mean for the collective. Uh, Fomahal is in the mouth of the fish. Okay. And that is, so we'll go forward here. And we're looking at 3000 BCE here, just because we were looking at spring equinox in Aldebaran. But when we have Fomahal, here is, now I need to hide my uh, horizon. Can you see that now? Yeah. So here is Fomaho. And that is the southern fish. It is, it's not the fish of, of the constellation Pisces. This is the southern fish. And here's Aquarius pouring all that sweet purified water into its mouth. 
that marked out the winter solstice and that's at about four degrees of Pisces. Okay. Yeah. Um, one interesting phenomenon to recognize when we're looking at fixed stars and the zodiacs is that in Western astrology, we use the Western, Western tropical zodiac, yeah. which is based on the, the interplay of light and dark over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. So we have one of those points, the, the, the spring equinox tomorrow. Okay. And that's going to be, you know, that's where the zero degrees Aries point is. Yes. We also have a sidereal zodiac, which is used in Eastern or, or Vedic or Jyotisha astrology mm -hmm. that is more related to the constellational positions, but is still equally divided into 360 degrees and, and 30 degree signs. Mm -hmm. What we, what, what like Babylonians may have used is a constellational zodiac where they were looking at just kind of these, you know, constellations themselves without necessarily having zodiacal signs or houses does that does that make sense yes yes it does because these these constellations a lot of them are a lot bigger than some of the other ones so they're not of equal size mm -hmm. and what is interesting is that when back three thousand years ago the tropical zodiac and the constellational zodiac mm -hmm. matched up more than they do now mm -hmm. so now when we're when we have the sun in pisces they, they are overlapped with the stars of Aquarius, okay? Yep. And as we move through Aries, we're going to see them overlapping with the stars of the constellation, you know, Pisces here or whatnot. Like, let me see if I'm doing that correctly. I don't want to get confused. Well, you get the idea. There's going to be different constellations that match up with tropical signs. And I think this is really interesting because... There's a lot of debate and argument about the different zodiacs and which one's right and which one do we use and things like that. The method that I found to be really effective and, and why I really like the, the fixed stars now is because I, what I'm doing is overlapping the understanding of the signs of the tropical zodiac and the interplay between light and dark and some of the mythological meanings of the sidereal constellations that happen to be in those areas of the zodiac now versus thousands of years ago right so can i like maybe i'm um, see if yeah. i understand this Go just ahead. to give an example thinking about the decans for instance mm -hmm. which right the 10 each 10 degrees of each sign we use full sign houses so right the first 10 degrees of gemini etc cetera, etc cetera. right um you know the this when when that system was created the fixed stars that would have been maybe rising with that Deccan are no longer rising with them now because of procession. Yes. But perhaps what's really beautiful about your study of the Deccans is that you th there's like that the, that star, the nature of that star is sort of infused in that Deccan. And so it's a way to sort of like, you know, um, capture the changes throughout time. Totally. That so that seems you know, like a really interesting very specific example of that overplay in your work. Yeah, yeah. I think the decans are fluid. Mm -hmm. I think that the the meaning of this of the signs and the decanic meanings are definitely changeable, you know? Yeah. And that we've seen this and I've heard Austin Kopic and Robert Schmidt both talk about this, is that they had, you know, tons of different star lists over the course of many thousands of years because they just kept changing their positions, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this, this is really true for, for, for example, my, um, my son is in the second decan of cancer okay. and, uh, right now Sirius rises, you know, in the decan that my son is in mm -hmm. and the stars of Castor and Pollux rise in the decan that my Mercury is in. Okay. So, so what, what I've found is that the stories of, of Castor and Pollux right here yeah. in Gemini really echo the way that my Mercury works, even though it's in the sign of the crab. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. Like yeah. here's, here's Pollux, which my uh, Mercury is very close to in projected ecliptical degree. It's at about 22 degrees cancer. Mm -hmm. And Pollux is a fixed star that, that speaks to, oh, it was the twin that had to give up 
some of its um, immortality so that it, the other twin could live, so that Castor could live after th these two twins got in a fight with another set of twins and Castor was slain, right? Yeah. And Pollux was so upset by this that, that he basically begged Zeus to, to split time on Olympus and the underworld so that he could be with his brother again for a, somewhat of a period of time. And um, I've experienced stuff like that in my, my story. Uh, both of these stars were storytellers. Castor is a little bit more associated with seeing the bright side of something, and Pollux may be about experiencing some of the darker aspects of something, right? Because Pollux had to, had to you know, sacrifice and there's been many times in my life where I've had to give up something so that something else could have life. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. so that story, that myth has played out in my experience over and over and over again. Um, yeah, like definitely with my family. I've had a lot of family stuff where I had to give up. Uh, I don't not, not give up, but I had to co make a compromise with uh, a self-directed dream or thing that I wanted to do because there was someone in my family that needed me to support them, you know? Mm -hmm. So to, to clarify, yeah, Pollux, the star, right. um, was at the time of your birth, was right. very close to your Mercury and Cancer. And so that's a well, one way, for instance, that we can read how the fixed stars then play out in a birth chart. Yeah, check this out. So let's just go to, well, no, I don't want to do that. I, I, I was going to say, let's go to my birth here because you can actually see it. But yes, th that is the gist of it. Yeah. Um, is that, well, yeah, let's do it because this will, this will make it all make a little bit more sense. And we'll go back to, now you see how old I am now. Ancient. We're ancient, CV. Why are we getting so old? Why is this happening? This new paradigm, basically yeah. in the 30s. So this is the chart of the sky at the moment of my birth, right? Yeah. Um, now, the, the location isn't exactly correct, but it, you'll get the basic idea. It, it's within a, a pretty good degree of, of accuracy here. But you can see here that here's Pollux. Okay. Okay. And here's the sun. You know, the sun is conjoining by projected ecliptical degree. Sirius, even though Sirius is farther off of the ecliptic than Pollux is, there still might be significations using that projected ecliptical degree with Sirius. Also, there's one that, that I actually really resonate with called Canopus, which is right here. And Canopus is the navigator in the Argo, the explorer right? Going off into the unknown and exploring and directing your life. And even though that one is way off the ecliptic, I definitely feel that energy in my life of being an explorer and wanting to explore unknown lands and things like that, right? Um, and the, even if it's mental, but if I were to look for Mercury here, yeah. so there's Mercury and it's hanging out right with Pollux in Mercury. Projected ecliptical degree. So, did you see that? Look at them. There's a party there. By There's the way, a party. This is Starry Night. What is this? Uh, Starry Night Pro. Starry is Night the Pro. program. Yeah, Just, it's awesome program. Is this the paid version or the free version? This is. I bought this one. Yeah, I bought this. And so that way you can keep all your like birth date. Like, for people who don't know this app, you can. That's how you can easily like pull up birth dates, same you would as an astrology chart. Astrology, um, software, astrology software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you can do with this program, if you want to get a visual of the sky, mm -hmm. is you can plug in your birthday and your birth time and birth location, because this will take you anywhere. And you can literally see what was going on when you were born. So here's Venus in my chart, right? Yeah. Venus is, my Venus is conjoined a fixed star called Rigel. So there's, this is 16 degrees Gemini, even though Venus looks like it's in the constellation of the bull. Yeah. This area here is uh, tropical Gemini, okay, because of precession. Mm -hmm. And Rigel is the foot of Orion in that river, the Eurydonis we were talking about here. And so this is like the God is beginning his journey of knowledge from like this 
hunter, this like raw sort of boorish, uh, instinctual hunter. And by the end of it, he's going to, to have great knowledge and maybe humility <laughs> like, yeah. because on the other side of the sky, there is Hercules right here, the kneeling one, all right? Pretty much almost opposite Orion. So there's this journey of Orion the hunter to become Hercules, uh, the one who was, uh, you know, more humble, more like uh, able to surrender to life and things like that. So maybe a lot of my explorations are bringing me humbling, but also like, I will say this, Rigel is a plant, a, a fixed star that is associated with like, you know, a, the river of information. Okay. Just like, <laughs> it's, it's like drinking from the firehouse. Do you remember like, what, what was, what was that? Um, I'm trying to think of like, there's some weird, like, you know, satire movie where they like, do you want to drink from the fire hose now? <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? No, but <laughs> some weird satirical movie where they're like, you get to drink from the fire hose now. And I feel like that's what's happening to me as far as like all the information that I'm trying to process in my brain is I'm trying to drink from the fire hose a lot of the time. And I, I'm going to blame Rigel for that. You know what? I'm going to add to that when I'm going to pop in. Do yeah. you have any Gemini placements? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, Venus. My Venus oh, is in or, Gemini. Okay, that makes right. sense. Maybe it's the rival and the Venus because I'm always like, I always get the like Gemini vibe from you. Yeah. My Gemini like picks up, even though I know like you're like, yeah. I think it's, I think that my Venus is very visible in my chart Yeah. because it is uh, rising to the midheaven. So the moon is very visible in my chart because the moon is right at the midheaven. You can see my moon is right here. Yeah. Okay. Right in the mouth of the whale, Menkar. <laughs> like here's, so that one's like, I'm like constantly being swallowed up by the collective unconscious kind of, <laughs> you know? but you could see here that this is literally what my chart looks like in the sky. This, this area right here is actually Leo. So this, this is the rising sign. Yeah. Okay, here's my son here in the 12th house in relationship to the horizon. Here's Venus in the 11th house right here. Mm. And then here's Menkar and the moon at my midheaven in the 10th house, the very height. Wow. And then you can kind of see as we go along, like my descendant is Aquarius and you've got kind of the stars of, of tropical Aquarius over here. Yeah. Okay. And um, hopefully I'm just, I'm moving my thing here. I'm, I hope that I'm pointing to the right spot because I'm looking at your stream and I'm it's not the same. Oh, you can't see this? You can't What's see that? It. Oh, you can't see the screen. I can see my pointer, but my pointer is at a different pos position on the screen than it is, I think, that I'm pointing. Is my pointer at the Capricorn planets right now? Or yeah. is it? I'm like, your pointer, you can't see my, your pointer looks, I'm really showing my colors here. I'm like, it's under the dragon. Okay. Like that yeah. looks like a telescope. Yeah, so so just try to follow along with me because my pointer is in a different place than I'm actually <laughs> pointing at on the screen here, uh, which is crazy. But but whatever, you know, you kind of I think you can get, kind of get the idea here, right? But but I do think that the the oh, sorry, what is the dragon? <laughs> the dragon. Yeah, this is Cetus right here, the whale. Oh, it's a that's a whale. Yeah, and it, it's the whale in ancient astrology myth or ancient mythology is different than our like you know our our humpback whales or our you know friendly yeah. whales are we looking at the same dragon he looks like a dragon it does sort of look like a dragon but it's a monster it's a sea monster let's put it that way it like, like, a whale like, people. like this was like the, the you know the whale that swallowed up jonah you know this was the yeah. you know everything that we fear that will consume us is is menkar right I don't want to fuck with that whale. No, no. But one one interesting thing to notice, excuse me, is that there is kind of northern and southern hemispheres to the sky here. We have a lot of our um a lot of our like monsters yeah. are in the southern part of oh. the uh below the ecliptic here and a lot of kind of like the deities they are in the northern heaven, I guess you could call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's one way to interpret a fixed star. Is it ab above the ecliptic in the northern latitude or mm -hmm. in the southern latitude? Because the northern stars were thought of as a little bit more um, fortuitous and the southern one's a little bit more difficult if there was a pair. 
And you can also think if they're on the right or the left side, uh, like that's another way we are looking at Pollux and Castor. Castor was on the right side okay. and Pollux was on the left. So they thought of the stars on the right side if there were a pair to be a little bit you know, easier to deal with. One thing I like to talk about with the, the so southern and northern ones is there's these two fixed stars here in Cancer. Yeah. Acellus borealis and Acellus australis. And those are the the uh the northern and the southern ass. <laughs> so like, right? They're these like donkey stars. And um the northern one, uh borealis, was a little bit easier to tame than the southern one. These were the 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 donkeys or the mules that helped Dionysus uh you know carried him across a marsh when he was withering in the heat of the summer sun and he rewarded them by putting them into the sky as as stars and um but the southern ass was like a little bit harder to control it was like bucking and things like that right yeah. so you know there, there is some associations of difficulties with that fixed star uh like accusations and like rumors and reputation stuff i mean there's all sorts of interesting ways of thinking about it if you look at the ancient texts though yeah you know, every other star, you're like, you're going to burn in a fire. You're going to die in a, in a horrible death, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily true uh, in our modern society that is, you know, I don't know, castrated on some level as far as like safety concerns. Although I have seen, um, I have seen some of the more challenging significations still manifest in their own way. Like I have some friends that have algal placements. Algol is one, so that's what I'm gonna, we're going through. So we have um, the, the, the Algol is a royal star, correct? Well, Algol is one of the Bohemian fixed Bohemian, stars. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and where's Algol? Algol is right here, uh, in the head of Medusa, right? It's at it's it is at 26 degrees of Taurus. Okay. Okay. And Algol is a nasty one. Algol is is a is a binary star that regularly is eclipsed by like a dark another dark star near its orbit or a dark planet or something of that nature so yeah. it it blinks <laughs> like and anything that blinked in and out of existence to the ancients was that was bad news you know that was not good yeah. um so there was you know there's a they thought it was the blinking eye of medusa that that was you know that, and, and this is true in many cultures and in, in in the Chinese uh, mythology around the stars, they called this piled up corpses. So anytime algal placements were concerned, there was death. Um, there is themes of beheading because Medusa lost her head. I've had people who did some, have either had algal placements or, you know, were using like some algal talisman or something like that. One of the things that uh, a lot of people are starting to do now again that have been done for many centuries, but it's becoming more popular is they will make uh, astrological materia based on uh, connections with a planet or the moon with a particular fixed star to try to draw its essence into a talisman or into a, an oil or something like that. And uh, to use the essence of that star to, or to cultivate it. Um, and there's been some people who have used algal for protection and things of that nature because it was a star associated with like really, you know, defeating your enemies and like, you know, really strong protection and, and kind of this kind of sacred mm, feminine strength too. I think that sometimes algal gets a bad rap, uh, deservedly so. There is some real challenges with the fixed star, don't get me wrong, but there is also some some mythological themes of female empowerment with this fixed star too, so that should be pointed out. But I've I've heard stories of people who used fixed algal talismans that literally saw someone die on the subway and saw their head rolling around on the tracks, you know, and they're like, oh shit, there's algal, you know, like um, I'm laughing. That's not approved. I don't know what to do. That felt like liking something like on Facebook that wasn't appropriate. What's that? I laughed and then I'm like, oh God, should I be laughing? Well, it's the this the laugh of horror, right? <laughs> like, so, yeah, that was my laugh. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we laugh because we're like, oh man, that's the dense, you know. Um but but yeah, I think that these mythological stories associated with the fixed stars can play out really literally. 
And um, I've just found that working with clients to circle it back around, yeah. a lot of the times it will bring a lot of layers of depth to understanding your some of the fate that you may not be able to change completely. I do think that the fixed stars have uh, a more of an association with destiny and with uh, some of the un more unchanging laws that we have to work within as human beings living this life. Um, you know, I talked about in my fixed star talk, hem hemermene, which is, you know, roughly translates to that which is allotted, right? And hemermene is kind of that that destiny, that fate that was associated with the Moir, the Moirai, uh, the three, the three fates, Clotho, the spinner, yeah. Atropos, the cutter, and Lucasus, the allotter or the apportioner. Yeah. And I had saw this really great talk by um, Dorian Geisler Greenbaum, mm -hmm. where she talks about the Clotho, the spinner was associated with the fixed stars, the non-wandering portion. Mm -hmm. And Clotho spun the threads of life right onto her spindle. And that spindle was the spindle of Ananke, the spindle of compelling the earth to revolve, okay? And, you know, so we can think about this as the threads of life that we're weaving into our life, yeah. um, but that's the material, right? That is the stuff that we're working with. That is the kind of the elements that we've been given to craft a life with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, depending on which planet you have in contact with it, you could be doing something different with that fixed star. Like if you have, you know, Mars on Algol, that's a very different experience than Venus on Algol, right? Um, Mars on Algol may bring you some accidents or some head injuries or neck injuries or something of that nature. Uh, whereas Venus may be more about trying to harmonize that energy into your life or uh, there may be something related to your relationships where you have to play out some kind of role. I heard a really great, this, I'm really impressed with this woman recently. Her name is T, T, T Susan Chang. Are you familiar with her? Um, I'm obsessed with her. Despite oh, the fact that, Despite the fact that on her podcast, Fortune's Wheelhouse, she went on a really mean tirade against people <laughs> with Mercury and Pisces placements. Despite I, that, th I think I heard you say, mention I, that at one point. Guy, and if I meet her, it's the first thing I'm ever going to say. It's mean, it's mean spirited. Um, <laughs> However, she's brilliant and I'm right. up with her. Go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She has a lot of Virgo placements. So I think that she probably has like, you know, some Virgo beef with Mercury Pisces type stuff. Although I will say she's a Pisces rising. So that's interesting to me that yeah. um but but yes, like everyone's gonna have some you know, where we're gonna be like, I'll fight you over that, you know. <laughs> like, but I did hear her recently speak with Chris Brennan. Um, yep. about the connection with tarot and astrology and just oracular space in general. And I think that, you know, her viewpoint really resonated with me as far as like uh, sympathetic magic is what she was talking about. Yeah. Like she was talking about pulling a, a particular tarot card over the course of a day. And like if she got the, the 10 of swords, She's like, okay, that energy, it has to be, I have to give it, like, I have to ground it somehow. Mm -hmm. Like that energy has to express. It's fated to express in my life. But what she would do is like, I'm going to get 10 sewing needles and I'm going to poke them into some, I don't know, vegetable or something. I don't know, whatever. I don't think she mentioned vegetable, but I can just imagine like someone taking a potato and like 10 of swords in the potato. I, I think it's because she was also a um, food writer. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. Consciously in that end, so. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, because because I don't like I said I don't think I heard her mention food specifically, but it would make sense that she would do something like that. <laughs> um, but but I think that her point being is that in so she was consciously expressing the energy yeah. so that it didn't happen to her, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I like that idea. I, I, that's something I really want to ex experiment with because when we become aware of these fixed star mythological, m perhaps more faded stories, maybe we can consciously integrate them rather than having them be imposed upon us because of our ignorance of them and then experience them as fate rather than as something we can work with. Does that make sense? 
Absolutely. And I might um, extend that to maybe the entire chart. I know a conversation we were having this morning, I was mentioning like, when I was talking about my personal Mars and Sun and Aries, but this idea that, right, like if I didn't know astrology and I didn't know I had all these aggressive planets, my life would be different, right? Like having had anger issues or, you know, I'm like, why do I always like alienate people and cut them? But knowing that I can have, it gives me some insights like, oh, wow, this is part of me. Can I channel it through my like intense workout as opposed to like my friends? Right, right, right. Well, and like, for example, today, Mars is, you know, in the next two or three days, Mars is hanging out with Aldebaran yeah. and it's a very martial planet. So it, it, there is, or I'm sorry, fixed star. It's a very martial fixed star. Mm -hmm. And with that knowledge, it could really speak to, hey, we, we really have to watch our sense of integrity because it could be very easy to get into conflicts over, you know, moral righteousness. And if we don't uh, stay true to our honesty, our integrity, our, you know, commitment to ritualizing in a way that is within our philosophical boundaries, um, we may experience an, an intense uh, trial by fire. You know, I think we were, you were talking with uh, Paula, uh, Paula earlier today. Mm -hmm. She was talking about getting into a fight with her bandmate, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, and that maybe it was maybe it was a, a small integrity lapse at that point mm -hmm. where she experienced that trial by fire. And if we had if we had talked to her a week ago and be like, Paula, uh, <laughs> it's really important because, you know, Mars is on Aldebaran that if you yeah. get into conflicts, you can't hit below the belt. You got to be nice. You know, <laughs> maybe we would have been able to shift that through that awareness. But yeah. since, you know, she through no fault of her own was yeah. not completely aware of that. Thing that was happening, she lived it maybe as fate rather than as something that she was in control of. And, and Paula, if you're listening to this, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure that it's fine. <laughs> like, we all we all do this. And, but yeah. I mean, this is this is why I think astro studying astrology and all of these things is important because then that that returns to us. I think some of the agency, not not all of it. There's definitely things that we are co-creating with the divine that we are probably not going to be able to avoid. Like there's some events that you are going to experience and that's just written in the stars, but your reaction to it can change kind of the severity or the outcome sometimes. You know, I really do believe that. And I, and I was struggling with that concept when I first started studying traditional astrology because, you know, some of the people who really, pers you know, per subscribe to a stoic viewpoint yeah. uh, really are like, this is just the way it is. It's all written. You don't have any choice. You're just a, an actor on a stage and you're just playing your role out. And that may be true, but how how boring would that be? <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or how frightening would it be to just be like, well, I guess everything, every choice I've made is already like decided. And, uh, you know, it, it, it takes away a little bit of the hope quality. Mm -hmm. And, um, we are we are still going through the last hours of a decan of Pisces that is associated with Elpis or hope, right? And and there's a story with Prometheus where Prometheus uh, gave humanity the gift of hope in that Pandora jar, right? To to help them uh, to alleviate the suffering associated with them knowing of their impending doom and their demise, right? Because we, maybe we are some of the only creatures, and I don't know this for sure because I'm not another creature, but we may be some of the only animals that understand that we're going to die and like think about it. And it would be very difficult to continue on creating and doing things if we didn't have that element of hope, right? Um, so I think that understanding the fixed stars, understanding the mythology, understanding all the things that we could experience... Um, it just gives us some maneuverability, I think, around it a little bit, because I do think that in the planetary portion, which which Dorian Greenbaum associated with a tropos, the cutter, the wandering portion, I think there is some flexibility in that where we can propitiate a planet if we wanted to think about it in like a ritualistic astrological magic way. We can kind of, you know, ask a planet for a little bit of flexibility through ritual practice and things like that. Um, we can talk to uh, the daimon, 
as an intermediary between us and the planet, uh, which would be associated, I think, a little bit more with Lachesis, the allotter or the apportioner, mm -hmm. the sublunar realm. And there, there's all sorts of complicated astrological magic practices around this. I, I have a very limited knowledge of astrological magic and, and astrological ritual. Mm -hmm. I do, I do um, say Orphic hymns in the morning to the planet of the day and try to craft a relationship with the planet. And I do have a little altar that I have set up, but um, my partner is much more into that than I am. She's a hoodoo practitioner and does some astrological magic as well and is much more plugged in with the astrological magic community than I am. Yeah. Um, I have a, a passing interest of it with it, um, but I think of my role as more of a, I don't know, an arch archivist and yeah. uh, you know something like that, like a, a teacher uh, where I'm just kind of like, I want to understand it. I don't necessarily feel like I always have to manipulate fate, I guess. That's, mm -hmm. I, I, I have, uh, I'm still nervous about that aspect of it because I think that when you are trying to mess with universal forces like that, it's, it's easy to screw it up. And I, I, I don't want to like, uh, I don't want to make some terrible mistake with it, I guess, you know, <laughs> like, I think that what I want to do is understand what is going on in my life so that I can navigate it gracefully, right? Yeah. Rather than say, I'm going to, I want to get this from the planet. So I want the universe to give me this thing. That is, we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. That's something that always rubs me. And I think you the wrong way. Uh, as far as when people are like, I'm going to say this so that I can get more sky candy, you know, or, or. I, I always feel there's like two camps. There's yeah. like the, like, manifestation of like you know a waxing moon always means like give me was it someone in a shoot's class who is like the, what is it like the cosmic ferrari right <laughs> right that was a, that's an old one man we you remember we we actually had a beam on that didn't we with him and his cosmic ferrari <laughs> like, you're, you're throwing it back here <laughs> yeah. so there's like that camp of just people being like okay just pray harder right and I think of like having taken some classes with Austin and Coppock is like serious, serious practitioners. Like it's interesting having taken with classes like him with him. I'm like, I am not touching any of this. Right. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm going to like. Well, he's a master, right? I mean, he he and his wife are masters of this type of art. Him and like people like Christopher Warnock and you know, people of that ilk, Cliff, Cliff Lowe knows a lot about this stuff. I mean, they've crafted their whole careers on knowing the Picatrix, Agrippa, all of the different ways of engaging with astrological magic. And I think they're doing something slightly different um, than like the, the people that are just like, let me get, let me. Well, no, there's something, it's a different camp. It's totally yeah. different. Like, and, and it's I have something I have such reverence for. Like, I'm sure. Like, okay. Like these people are, I feel like they're using it in this really specific, interesting, meaningful, humble ways. Right. Um, it's just beyond my complexity of understanding. I would well, and and think about it like this. I, I think to 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 uh, to summarize my thoughts on that. Yeah, it's just a tool. Magic can be a tool too, you know. And I think that the integrity of the practitioner is really what matters. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the magic part of it is bad. I don't think that the you know if you want to try to be like neo in the matrix and, and manipulate a little bit you know yeah, yeah but the key is like what is your motivation is the motivation self-serving or is it to be of service i know some people who have done some very powerful magic to protect people you know to help somebody in need yeah. and to help to move something um a situation forward that that was of service to the person they were doing that ritual for. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 again, it's integrity is really the, the key with, yeah. with Mars on Aldebaran today is what is your motivation? Is it, is it within your integrity or not? And, and that, that is, uh, I do think that there are moral gray areas for everybody. Everybody has a different scale of what is right for them. You know, we do have a few universal truths that we have to have as a community so we don't go around like murdering each other or, you know, stealing everyone's stuff all the time. But um, 
but there are other flexible parts depending on what you believe or what you don't. Yeah, so just to sort of wrap things up, um, two last questions, last two questions. One, because we never went through all of them. What are the four royal stars if people want to just pay attention to those? Yeah, we've got uh, Aldebaran, which we talked about today, which was associated with the spring equinox. Yep. 10 degrees Gemini, the eye of the bull. Eye of the bull. We have Regulus, which is associated with the summer solstice, the okay. ancient summer solstice, I should say, right? The 3000 BCE summer solstice. And that is the heart of the lion at about zero degrees of Virgo now. Um, and that's associated with uh, power, fame, um, but also the nemesis of not uh, pursuing power at all costs. Brady talks about not taking revenge. Um, this is something, this is a star that's rising on Donald Trump's ascendant. And, uh, you know, he's risen to great power and had like fame and things like that. But a lot of the things that have, whenever he's gotten in trouble, it's when he's tried to take revenge on his enemies, which is talking to some of the the, the stories associated with Regulus, right? May I, may I pop into that one too? Sure. And that one's important because that one did just recently move right. 29 Leo to zero Virgo. And do you think that that sort of maybe, I think of how we just sort of like moved into this well, not the, but an age of air, right? With the Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions. And it makes me think, you mentioned like, you know, how we think of power and kingliness, right? With that star, like moving, it makes me think of like, oh, does this mean we're like more like, you know, I feel like that solar powered showmanship of Leo, maybe the emphasis is on more mercurial things, which makes me think of like people who can like communicate and all the things that are needed to sort of this new like internet world. How Absolutely. that to that. Yeah, I don't think that we are going to have the consolidation of authority and power with like individuals as much anymore, like kings or queens. Yeah. I think that it is going to be through what kind of skilled craft can you offer to the world? You know, like what kind of abilities do you have rather than just this divine mm, bestowing of power upon people, right? Like we don't really have rock stars as much anymore, right? We're seeing like the rock stars almost go away. We don't have David Bowie's anymore. I mean, you could you could argue that there are a few, but it's not the same vibe, you know? No, and I just made me think of like what's you know happening with the sort of the the quick crumbling of the monarchy in England, all of that, right? Like that yeah. relation is just perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, that's a really great point because that has been a royal family that has, you know, been in power for a very long time. And then now they've, they've, you know, been losing their, their kind of relevance over the last, I don't know, hundred years or, or however long, yeah. but now it's really, we're really seeing it accelerate since, mm -hmm. since uh, Regulus moved into Virgo. It's like, holy shit, this is going away. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, so, so, so that's the summer solstice one. Okay. We've got Antares that's associated with the fall equinox. That okay. that is the heart of the Scorpion in Scorpio. Yeah. That fixed star is at ten degrees of Sagittarius, tropical uh, degree now. That's where um, my Jupiter is, by the way. I think it's my so that's the lesson of intensity, right? Like that <laughs> is the, you know, this, that's we, I always talk about the story of the frog and the scorpion with that one, where the scorpion wants to cross the river. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, you know, there's a frog there. He's like, frog, can you take me across the river? I can't swim. And, and frog's like, I don't know. You're a scorpion. And scorpion's like, no, it's fine. It's fine. And then they get halfway across the, the river with the scorpion and the frog's back and the scorpion stings the frog. And they're like, frog's like, what the, what the hell, man? Now we're both going to drown. And scorpion's like, I, I'm a scorpion. That's in my nature. I just, I can't help it. And so I think that that story speaks to in, you know, Brady talks about intensity and obsession and only using the amount of strength that is necessary and not like overwhelming people and like kind of like pursuing something, you know, at all costs. Um, Michael Jordan has his, I believe his moon is on Antares and you could, you could see, I don't know if you watched, did you watch the last dance? Okay. And now I need to, because everyone it's keeps talking really about good. it. It's really good. Even for people who aren't like super into sports, yeah. it's a really good like human interest kind of documentary series. 
but he it was one of the most intense competitors yeah. you know in the history of sports and you could really see the the antares kind of energy with him um to the point where he rubbed a lot of his teammates the the wrong way you know like he he had a lot of success but he probably had some some situations where that intensity wasn't appropriate so how can you use that intensity in the appropriate spheres and not when it is inappropriate or when gentleness might be the more the better play you know and then just to wrap up our our fixed star journey with the royals uh fomahal is the fixed star in the mouth of the fish that is receiving the water of aquarius and that was associated with the winter solstice and um, that fixed star has to do with kind of a charisma, with like a poetic, like Austin Coppett calls it like the wizard star. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was like this kind of like, oh, I don't know, you're able to almost manipulate reality and like use your charisma to like bring things into manifestation. Um, but the, the, the thing to avoid there is using your, your charisma for selfish purposes. Um, because when we try to get others to believe in a cause that we have, right, that we can lead people down the primrose path to, you know, or whatever, like the path to hell or something like that. Um, so, you know, Brady even talks about a Paran relationship that Hitler had with Fomalhaut, like where he believed in something so greatly and he had this charisma about him but it, it was for this very destructive purpose she also said that john lennon had a contact with this but and, and he wrote something like imagine where he was using his charisma to try to think about a better world although there is he's his reputation's taken a hit over the last few years because of his you know i think he probably had some issues with uh domestic stuff that that wasn't you know, wasn't good. He was a, he was a complicated figure, you know, as as we all are. But uh, he could be, he was probably kind of a jerk too. I would imagine. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I feel that that's a lot of people we probably romanticize. But yeah, I think I anyway. I was I think I I read like a biography on him and Yoko when I was like twenty, and even then I was like, ooh. I think people are complicated. I think somebody can do good things and bad things in their life. I think that. Uh, we don't have to just put them in one category that, you know, I think that we do live a lot of shades of gray as far as like what we are contributing to the collective. Um, Cause like, some of the music he made was amazing and that he did a lot of good for people and, you know, tried to spread messages of peace, but then, you know, in his domestic life, he abandoned child. He probably was not a very nice partner in some of his relationships. And so mixed bag. Well, it's also too, just to go back, but you know, you were talking about uh, Michael Jordan, I believe, and this idea that too, I mean, we see that sort of in the astrology chart, the same thing that could potentially make us really powerful and give us a certain power can also be our downfall. And so maybe that's where astrology comes in to understanding that, like the same thing, you know, saying like, oh shit, like, can I maybe realize that the same thing that makes me again powerful also makes me alienate people and kind of work with that. <laughs> that totally. personal reflection is really powerful. <laughs> totally, totally. I, that that is very, very true. And I, yeah, I think that the key with like something like the royal fixed stars is temperance, right? Yeah. Uh, balance, being able to find the right mixture and the right situations for using that power, and not always trying to apply it to every single circumstance in your life. And you know, I think that anytime we get crazy crazy ambitious at the expense of other people we can get off track i mean i i'm i've been guilty of this in the past uh <clears throat> like when i was younger i was a musician and i really wanted to be famous and I, I i always was nervous about it because i grew up watching behind the music on vh1 which will scare the shit out of anybody <laughs> like, you know. like i never you told me this once like i've never forgotten that because i think like that's so, I don't know, like, that's so unique that <laughs> you were, you, you were scared. Like, it, I was, I, I, well, because they would, they were telling all these stories of all these super famous people that, whose music I enjoyed. 
and, <laughs> and, and for dramatic purposes told yeah. us, you know, their rise to fame and then their downfall and, yeah, and that, that dumpster. right. That, that always <laughs> stuck with me, you know, and that doesn't mean that every famous person has, has, you know, had a tidy heroin addiction or like beat their wife or had a car accident or some crazy thing like that. But, um, but I definitely was hesitant about pursuing power and fame at all costs. And you and I are Leo ascendants. So th some of that can be uh, seductive at times, I mm -hmm. think too. Uh, are, which decan Leo are you? Do you know the degree first, of your rising? First, because I'm three degrees. Because my, okay. my, my, yeah, because it's trying my son. Yeah. So your, your decan is a little different than mine. Um, mine's third degree okay. Leo, which, mm -hmm. which here's the thing. When I was born, uh, Regulus was still in the third decan of Leo, right? Yeah. So even though my ascendant isn't super, super close to Regulus, yeah, I definitely feel some of the energy of that fixed star just with its decanic placement, yeah. you know, of not having to pursue power ruthlessly because I've definitely had like, I've had times in my life where I've been like, mm, I just want to, I want to dominate, you know, like I, I, that's, I, I was, I did sports as a kid too. And I was a very intense competitor. I wasn't always the biggest person or the fastest or the most skilled, but there was nobody out there that tried as hard as I did. And I, and I had to really regulate that energy. Regular. Regular. That? Regulus, regulate, Regular. right? Yeah. But, but I, but I, it's, it's strange because I still do that. Like, I've put out four videos this week that are almost an hour long. And yeah, one. Five. what's that? Five. This. Five. This is the fifth one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's it's the same energy. Do you know what I'm saying? It's the same intensity where like I'm gonna try harder than anybody. And I'll be damned if my body just like melts into goo because I get I sustained a lot of injuries when I was uh playing sports because I would just I was a crazy person, you know, like, um, do you remember if you go, if you watch like the, the last dance to bring it back to that, when I was in high school, uh, the, the bulls were really popular. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about the bull in El Debron today. Mm -hmm. And Dennis Rodman was the, my hero at that period of time. Yeah. And Dennis Rodman's energy was like, he is going to try harder than anybody else on that court. He's just going to relentlessly keep coming at you. And I basically made my high school basketball team as a senior in high school, as a five foot, 10 and a half uh, <laughs> power forward, <laughs> like, which is like what the, what Dennis Rodman was doing, getting rebounds, yeah. playing defense. And I, I had never played organized basketball in since I, I played one season at the YMCA when I was seven years old and like I would play in these pickup games with yeah. my friends in gym and I would just be like going crazy and they're like you just try out for the team because mm -hmm. you're just a crazy person out there and but it was that kind of energy where that intensity uh allowed me to make a varsity basketball team after never playing organized basketball but i had to learn how to regulate that energy i was just a pain in the ass to people the coach was like you know what you're probably never gonna play dude but you make everybody else work harder and like that's what i want so if you want to be on the team that's cool if you don't i understand uh and i was like hell yeah like <laughs> I'm, I'm in um but but i think that i've had to learn over time to regulate that intensity and I think that um, that's really the key when we're working with this mythological stories is mm -hmm. there will be positives and negatives to these stories. And you can kind of try to integrate from that equilibrium point. Um, like I've had other clients recently that are working with a fixed star called Algorab, which oh. is at 13 degrees of Libra and it's associated with Corvus the Crow who was distracted, was given a sacred task by Apollo to fill the grail cup. And he failed because he got distracted by these delicious figs and all the earthly delights. Yeah. And instead of being honest about it, he lied and like blamed Hydra, who he's riding on the back of. So one of the things I talk about with my clients that have Algarab placements is, hey, it's important for you to, to really concentrate and not get distracted just by the earthly pleasures and if you do have an integrity lapse, it's 
really important for you to own it and to like just move forward rather than trying to place blame on somebody else. And, you know, 99 times out of 100, they're like, oh, yeah, I, I often do have attention challenges and I have, you know, I've had some integrity lapses in the past with that. And, you know, and, and just that knowledge alone can be very validating and also give somebody a point to work on, right? If we think about how can we work with this energy, they can recognize in the moment, oh, this is a fig. I need to work harder to focus, right? So wow. like with me, I can see like, oh, okay, I'm being a little too intense right now. I need to back off a little bit and take a break, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Do you think, I mean, maybe I can summarize this as saying, you know, I think coming back to a simple way to work with the fixed stars is even just going through your chart and identifying maybe some stars that have significant planetary placements for you. And it could be just as simple as just reading the mythology um, associated with it and seeing how that res um, resonates with you. Because I know like it seems like something like tarot where people get really intimidated. Like, am I doing it wrong? But I right. think perhaps it's just as easy as being like, no, like listen to the story and see how it hits with you. Yes, that and that's perfect. And that, because what what I was trying to explain with T. Susan Chang, right, yeah. was that was basically her point is that, uh, you know, our brains are like radio receivers that mm -hmm. where we're trying to tune into certain frequencies. Mm -hmm. I think that the fixed stars themselves are emitting these channels. Yeah. And we can tune into the channel in various different ways and work with that particular station. Um, and I, that's why I'm not super hung up on project, projected ecliptical degree versus paran, parans. Um, I really uh, got confused with it when I was first started studying fixed stars. And I was really like, I had a lot of anxiety about whether I was doing it correctly. And I think that that concept that you just mentioned helped me relax about it because if there is an oracular message that wants to come through, it will find a way. And this is how, if you ask me mainly, how do I work with fixed stars and what do I appreciate about them the most? It's the stories, it's the myths. And I think that for anybody that wants to start with fixed stars, start by learning the mythology, start mm -hmm. by learning the stories, start by understanding, you know, where they are in the sky and maybe you'll know, find a list of where they are in particular areas, although that's the point of debate, but learn the stories, right? Learn the stories first because the constellations that those particular stars are a part of are going to inform and bring meaning into the, the stars themselves and the planets and, and feed the planets that make contact with it, okay? So Austin Kopic talks about them being like, uh, root systems that the planets are drawing on, like the planets are putting their roots and they're drawing upon the, the strata of the fixed stars, right? They're drawing upon the, the um, materia of them, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, to sort of wrap this up for people who've maybe who are watching this and um, I don't think you mentioned this in your, um, I'll once again state, this is sort of follow up to the lecture you did, which is on your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I find your Instagram, like an absolutely wonderful way to keep up with the fixed stars because you do the work every day. You're pointing out sort of which ones are in play right now. And I think just very simply, if people want to learn more about these, I know following you on Instagram, seeing these fixed stars and maybe a simple task just to be like, oh, every day I'm going to see what fixed stars in play and then um, look up that story. That seems like a very simple way that people can start engaging with these now. Yeah, yeah, I make these little cards that yeah. have tarot cards on them and i'll list all of the information with that deck in like the deity associated with it the host the face ruler and then i'll list the fixed stars that are in that deck in um, i used to put a picture of the fixed stars when every time a planet would make a conjunction and that just there was just too many things yeah. so now i just do the deck in cards and put it out there and yeah it, it is a great way to just start engaging piece by piece Mm -hmm. I would say that the, the way that I've found success and the way that I've started to become, to have more of an encyclopedic knowledge of these things is that every day I'm engaging with small pieces of it. And it's a consistency 
of mm -hmm. just over and over and over again, learning little, little pieces here and there. And um, eventually it just becomes a part of you, you know, through, through practice and through returning to it every day. Um, and, and that's, that's the way anything is with life, right? It's the daily practices and eventually you, you uh, figure out what it's all about, or maybe you don't. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. I'm going to wrap this up to say that it yeah. seems that doing that small piece by piece, right? Like you're doing these chunks is perhaps maybe your own way of regulating your regulus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. <laughs> running totally. at it. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's, it's definitely the way that I try to stay humble is just breaking things into manageable pieces and not trying to do something too big. Uh, cause I, I've often tried to go big or go home and, and it never works. I just need to kind of consistently do the work and recognize that those small daily offerings add up to big things over time. Right. And add up to a library of work and things like that. So, yeah. My, my scorpion on top of the frog agrees. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can use that intensity when, when the moment calls for it. Right. Yeah. Like when the, when the moment is appropriate, your intensity is going to help move mountains and bring you honor with it's on Jupiter, right? In mm -hmm. the fifth house. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that if you're involved in a creative project, like you can probably just be like, I'm all in it, you know, in it to win it. And that might be appropriate at that period of time. You got to remember to eat, you got to remember to sleep and pay your bills and stuff. And uh, not to drive other people crazy with my intensity because you right. can small bites so i think that's where we uh less than we can both um learn from right 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 and maybe even you know with fifth house like how you pursue pleasure too like mm -hmm. you may be very intense about those types of things and you got to figure out if people can keep up with you or there may be some times where that's appropriate and other times where it's like oh boy i gotta <laughs> gotta relax <laughs> you know Oh, that's a, that's a whole can of worms. Um, this has been wonderful, Spencer. Thank you so much for spending time. Um, uh, this is exciting. So I'm going to share this with you and you can do whatever you want with this recording. But for those listening, this is Spencer. I'm CB, I should say. I'm CB Henriette of Art of the Zodiac. Um, you know, astrology, skincare, art. I don't make it. I just appreciate it. You are Spencer Michaud, Spencer Michaud Astrology, one of my favorite astrologers. I always love talk, chatting with you. Uh, obviously of you your YouTube, your website, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if people like this today, I'm going to send them over to buy you a coffee on your website now, right? SpencerMichaud.com yeah. or Spencer Michaud Astrology, I always forget. SpencerMichaud.com is my website, and I'm on buymeacoffee.com where people can kind of buy me a coffee or a tea or something to show yeah. support, because I do most of my work donation-based. I put a mm -hmm. lot of my work out there for free, probably most of it right now. And that's the model that I've chosen to kind of support the work that I do at the moment. Yeah, I love it. And you do offer a lot of free content. So like I said, people, I encourage anyone to go to your um, Twitter. I follow you on Instagram. I'm not active on Twitter very much, but Facebook, et cetera. But yeah, YouTube, you do a lot of YouTube. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do a video today, so <laughs> I'll do another one. Good it's, Lord. It's um, the Equinox. I got to get my Equinox video out. Oh my goodness. I know. I was trying to do. Um, thank you so much. And this has been wonderful. And I will chat with you soon. Thank you, CV. It's always a pleasure. Bye. All right.